Welcome to Finding Stuff Out. Today, you get two shows in one. I'm practicing my magic act for my school's talent show. I'm trying to make my guinea pig squeakers vanish into thin air. So far, it's not working, but magic is all about changing stuff into other stuff, right? So maybe your questions about solids, liquids, and gases will help. Here's the first one from Victoria. Why isn't magic real? Whoa! Magic is real! I just saw a magic man burn water! It started to smoke, and he said, if I don't buy a ticket to his next show, he's gonna burn down all our water! Oh. Magic is real! Magic is real! Magic is real! People used to think that anything they couldn't explain must be magic. Get me out of here! Like if you showed someone finding stuff out who had never seen TV before, you could probably convince them that you shrunk me inside your magic box. Hey, yeah! Today, we know that magicians' tricks only look like magic. They all have logical, scientific explanations. Or do they? Is magic real? Maybe it is, and I just don't know how it works. But I promise to find out by the end of the show. Here's my second question. It's from Kevin. Why does a balloon float? Want to see me make this balloon disappear into thin air? But seriously, a balloon doesn't float. What makes it float is the helium. The balloon just goes along for the ride. I found out that the reason helium floats is because it's less dense than other gases in the air, like oxygen. But wait, how can a gas be dense? Doesn't that mean thick and heavy? But if the gases in the air are dense, why can't we see them? Why don't they crush us? My brain is steaming. It's going from a solid to a gas. That can only mean one thing. You're gonna make my head explode. Whew. I found out that dense just means something's tightly packed together. Like when you take snow and smush it into a hard snowball. You've made the snow denser. But some things are naturally denser than others. This maple syrup is full of sugary goodness. Water is less dense, so it floats on top. That's sort of what happens with helium. Helium's lighter than most other gases, so it floats on top of them. Have you ever wondered if you could float through the air using helium balloons? Well, you could if you had enough. Let's see if I can make squeakers float. That's all the balloons I have and they aren't enough. How many balloons would it take to get squeakers off the ground? Let's see. Squeakers weighs about 1,000 grams, and each balloon lifts about 14 grams. Wow, it would take 71 helium balloons just to lift squeakers. And a lot more for his cage. <laughs> I made a guinea pig fly. To lift an average kid, you need about 2,500 balloons. Your parents probably aren't gonna buy you that many at an amusement park. But Kevin, people do float through the air using giant balloons. Only these ones don't use helium. I went to a balloon festival to find out how they float. I'm here with balloon expert Wild Bill. So are these balloons the same as the helium ones that I get on my birthday? No, not at all, Harrison. These here are all cloth-filled balloons. We Just a big bag. All we do is we take the balloon and we fill it up with air. Mm -hmm. And then what we do is we superheat the air inside. Right. And then the balloon gets very, very light. Oh, I found out that when you heat the air, it makes it less dense, which is why they're able to fly. Exactly. You've got it. Somebody's been studying. That's good. <laughs> One, two, three, you. Dan, you on the handle? Come on down. You're on this side. Okay. I'm on this side, and we're going to bring this all the way back to where, where okay. the basket is, all right? Keep going until you run out of balloon. After unfolding the balloon... Here we go. We fill it up with air using this giant fan. Then, we turn on the heat with a gas burner. 
Bill has to make sure the flame doesn't get too close to the fabric, which can burn if it gets overheated. We're gonna go in, we're getting in soon. Okay, Harrison, come on board, right in here, man. This is so cool. So how exactly does the heat keep us up? I constantly put heat in because the balloon is always cooling. Right. So if I want to maintain this altitude, I got to put heat in. I'm going to do that right now. So the balloon is now flying in level of flight. Mm -hmm. And if we don't do anything, the balloon will start to cool and we'll start to descend. But if we let the balloon cool too much, then the balloon will come crashing to the ground too fast. <laughs> That's so, not good. So we're going to control the amount of heat we put in right. so we can find a nice soft place up forward here to land. Hey, squeakers, how do you get up here? <laughs> Look at them go. <laughs> I never would have thought those balloons would have gotten you this squeakers, high. Squeakers, man, this is the only way to get around. <laughs> you funny guy. Bye. How do you make water? I am the water monster. I make water with my water monster magic. Just kidding. I found out that water is made up of two gases in the air, oxygen and hydrogen. Here's how they get together. Gas has a dance party swinging through the air. Gas has a dance party. Gas is everywhere. Oxygen and hydrogen shake their derrieres. But a two H's bond with O. They turn to water. Down they go. When two H's bond to O, they turn to water. Look out below. <laughs> So water's made by connecting an oxygen atom with two hydrogens. But if you're wondering how I, Harrison the Magnificent, make water, here's a cool trick. I told my sister I was going to drink mud. She got really grossed out. But she didn't know there was a way to get clean water out of mud. Want to see how the trick works? <laughs> the experiment. This is called a distiller. I let my sister pour the mud into here and told her at the end of the week, I drink whatever liquid came out. But will all the water evaporate before the week is up? Or will I have to drink mud? When the sun heats up the distiller, the water in the mud starts to evaporate. You can see the water vapor fogging up the sides. It's condensing. Then, when it cools off, the vapor turns back into water and drips down into the container. Woo! All the water in the mud evaporated, but the dirt didn't. It all got left behind. My sister will be so disappointed. Nope. Mm -hmm. That mud sure had a lot of water inside of it. You know what else has water? Us. Three quarters of a kid's body is water. That's why we need to drink a lot of it. When you put water in the freezer in a jar, why does it break? It happened to me once. I accidentally put a jar of pickles in the freezer. It broke and made a big mess. But to answer Keon's question without making a mess, it's time for... Uh-oh. Dude, try this at home. Want to know a cool magic trick? Well, it's not really magic. It's science. But you don't have to tell anyone that. You take a plain, ordinary glass of drinking water and fill it all the way to the top. Then, tell your friends and family, prepare to be amazed. I'm going to make this water get bigger. Presto, change -o, water, grow -o. Then, put it in the freezer. When the water is frozen, it will have grown taller than the top of the glass all by itself. See, how did it do that? When a drop of water freezes, it spreads out to form an ice crystal. That's why a jar full of water breaks when you put it in the freezer. If the ice crystals can't go out the top, they break right through the glass. Remember that the next time you're putting away a jar of pickles. 
When you put boiling hot water in a cup and then put it in the freezer and freeze it, can you make it solid, solid, solid? To find out, please welcome my special guest, materials engineer, L.V. Dalgard. Hey, Harrison. Hey, I hope you have pickles in there. I like pickles. Not exactly. If I had pickles in here, they'd be frozen pickles. Oh. Maria wants to know if you can freeze boiling water and put it into really solid ice. Sure, of course. You can change the phase of water no matter what temperature it starts at. In fact, if you're someplace really, really cold and you take a cup of coffee and throw it into the air, some of those droplets are gonna freeze before they hit the ground. Really? And Yeah, and the same thing happens with spit. Cool. Let's do a little experiment. We're, we're not gonna be freezing spit around here, are we? Don't worry. I want you to take these glasses and put them on. Okay. Because we're gonna be dealing with liquid nitrogen, and liquid nitrogen is kind of like boiling oil. It'll, right. it'll burn your hand if you get it on your hand. Oh. So you're gonna put the gloves on too. It's so cold it burns. Nitrogen, of course, is not dangerous in and of itself. Okay. So you don't have to worry about getting it in your food, which is good because this is cream and sugar, and we're gonna make ice cream. Wow. And I'm gonna start by pouring a little bit of the liquid nitrogen into the cream and sugar. Whoa. I can't really see. There's so much fog. <laughs> Seems to be getting, like, frozen. It's getting there, right? Oh, it's getting icy now. You can feel ice chunks in Almost there. Almost ready. Whew. All right, well, if it's too hard to stir, maybe it's ready to, uh, maybe. to scoop yeah, some out hard and taste to... it. There we go. Bon appetit. Mm. Mm. Well, thank you for this scientific treat. You're very welcome. And here's another question. It's from Brianna. Why doesn't ketchup come out of the bottle sometimes and it makes a big mess? Well, the reason for that is that ketchup is what we call a non-Newtonian fluid. And in this case, that means that it gets thicker if you don't move it. Right. And it gets thinner if you do move it. So is there any scientific way to unstick it? Sure. Hey, that's not exactly scientific. Actually, it is. See, the blockage is in the neck where it's thick. Remember I told you it was a non-Newtonian fluid? Yeah. And if you apply pressure to it, it thins out. Uh. Well, guess what? Thins out in the neck, comes right out of the bottle. Non-Newtonian fluids, those sound cool. Is there any magic tricks I can do with them? Actually. Really? That would be perfect for... My Great Challenge! Today, my challenges are Kobe, Haley and Ashley, Zachary, Mateo, and Colton. So are you guys ready to do something amazing? Yeah! Yep. So if I told you you had to do some jumping jacks or jog for a couple of minutes, that sounds good, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But what if I told you you had to do it on a liquid without sinking? Yeah. So this is what you guys will be jumping on. It is made up of cornstarch and water. And let me show you something real quick. So if I am to punch it really fast, See, my hand does not sink, it's not wet. But if I slowly put it in, oh, oh. gross. When I say go, the first person on each team has to jump into the pool. And you have a minute of exercises to do, and you have to stay on top of the liquid. When the minute is up, you'll be switching with your teammates. But if you sink before the minute is up, you will be eliminated. The next person in line has to jump into the pool right away and take their place. The last team with a person still standing wins. Okay, are you ready? Yeah. Yep. Go. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Okay, you guys are eliminated. Next person in. This stuff is like quicksand. How can they jump on it? I can't get out. The first two challengers are out of the game. Here are the next two. Run and spot really fast. Oh my, oh my goodness. <laughs> hey, he has it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, You're eliminated. Oh, Please okay. switch with your teammate. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, hurry, get in. Oh, run yeah. fast, run faster. There we go. Go, go, we go, go. Oh. Okay, now let's try some jumping jacks. <laughs> How about just some straight jumping? Just do jumping, go. And switch, green team. Start doing some jumping jacks. 
Now let's try one foot. Oh, yellow, yellow team is eliminated. Green team won. Yeah. So did you guys think you could jump on a liquid? No. No? Well, I'm going to let LV explain why you could. OK, well, the way it works is we call this cornstarch and water together a non-Newtonian fluid. It gets thicker or thinner if you change the stress, if you hit it. So with ketchup, it gets thinner when we hit it. But with this, it gets thicker. Think of it like you're trying to run into a crowd of people, right? right? If you run really fast, you're just going to bang into them all. But if you go slowly and give them time to get out of your way, you'll be able to go through them. So it's the same thing with this. If you go really fast, you're just going to bounce off it. Well, thanks for playing my great challenge. And thank you, Elvie, for helping us find stuff out. You're welcome. Can a solid turn into a gas? I checked the answer and... Whoa. Everyone, please welcome magician Ryan Lalonde to my show. Hi, Harrison. Thanks for having me. Welcome. Happy to, happy to be here. Uh, sorry my hands are dry. Uh, do you have any moisturizer with you? I actually don't, sorry. OK, um, I guess I'll just use the moisture in the air. How? Well, here, I'll show you. Uh, my hand is empty. I'm going to make a fist. OK. And I'm just going to grab the water. See? What? The water and put it all in my hand. And you're going to see. How, how are you doing this? You must have something up your sleeve, right? Not quite. A magician never tells his secret. Basically, what I did is I turned a gas into a liquid. Let me try something. I have a silk, mm -hmm. which would be a solid. Right. I will put the solid into the glass. Now I have a white silk, mm -hmm. which I can turn into white milk. Is that one of those tricks where you make the audience look away and, and while they're not looking, you do something really fast? Harrison, you're a tough audience. There must be a scientific explanation. Dahlia was wondering, can you turn a solid into a gas? I think you can. Let me try something. Whoa, how'd you do that? Well, it's very simple. I use what magicians call flash paper. Right. It has uh, particles in the paper that, uh, that are flammable and help the paper disintegrate. Right. When paper burns, gases are formed. Don't you burn yourself with that? No, magicians have very safe ways of doing tricks. That's why kids should never copy the tricks they see on TV or in movies. I can show you something else about turning a solid into a gas. Right. Those are frozen blocks of carbon dioxide, also called dry ice. Whoa, it's bubbling and, and there's smoke coming out of it everywhere. So, Dahlia, the water warmed the solid carbon dioxide, and that made it turn into a gas. Oh, and I just thought of another example. A normal ice cube is solid, but when it melts, it turns into water. If that water gets hot enough, it turns into vapor. So water can be a solid, a liquid, or a gas, depending on the temperature. What I have here is two glasses full glass of room temperature water mm -hmm. and an empty glass. So we're going to put this white piece of paper over the glass okay. to make sure we know that this is the original empty glass. Now I'm going to pour about half the water, maybe just a little more, into the glass. Now the purpose of this trick is to see if I can actually freeze the water in the glass. You're going to see that it is actually frozen. <laughs> well, there must be a scientific explanation to that, too. Elvie already showed me how you can freeze things really fast. I guess you just don't believe in magic. Oh, that reminds me. I still have to answer Victoria's original question. Why is not magic real? The big answer is magic is real. Sort of. I can't wave a magic wand and make squeakers disappear. The tricks magicians do aren't real. Hey, whoa, Harrison. They're illusions, even if I can't explain how they're done. But the real world is pretty magical if you think about it. Think of all the stuff we saw that is real. Gas is turning into liquids. Liquids turning into solids. Solids turning into gas. 
Gas has even lifted me into the air. So even if I couldn't make Squeakers disappear... Squeakers? Where did he go? Squeakers? Squeakers? Whoa, whoa Harrison, Harrison, did you check your hat? Where? How'd you do that? I didn't see you do that. Well, you're not supposed to. It's magic. Hey, it's empty. What have you done with Squeakers now? My name is Squeakers, hey. and this is my show. Squeakers? How did you get there? I can't believe this. See you next time for more finding stuff out. Ryan, there has to be a scientific explanation to this. Just ask me a question that I don't know. That's why finding stuff out is the name of the show. My name is Squeakers, and this is my show. I'm finding stuff out that you don't know. Hey, guess what all this stuff's for? I've decided to grill my own lunch. An egg salad sandwich with tomatoes and lettuce. Okay, I'm not exactly sure what a farmer's supposed to wear or what a farmer's supposed to use. Anyway, why am I growing my own lunch? To answer Sarah's question. If there were no grocery stores, where would we get food? Good question. That makes me wonder, where does food come from in the first place? Like, where would I get spaghetti from? A noodle tree? That doesn't sound right. But everything you get from the grocery stores, including junk food, like mm -hmm. chips, donuts, or hot dogs, have to be made from stuff that was grown by a farmer somewhere. <laughs> what would we do if we couldn't get food from grocery stores? Would we grow it ourselves? I'm gonna give it a try. And by the end of the show, I'll have the answer to Sarah's question. But first, Brenna has a question that takes us right back to the beginning of it all. Who invented food? <laughs> oh, berries look delicious, but me not know if they are poison. Oh, me have idea what animals and see which berries they eat. Oh, oh, ah, ah, oh, 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 ah, ah, oh. Oh, monkeys eating berries. He seems okay. Now me eat berries. Mmm, that meat berries are poisonous. But me eat too many. Tummy ache. <laughs> Ancient humans may have figured out what foods were safe to eat by watching animals and copying them. But it wasn't always the best idea because some animals eat things that can make people sick. Then about 8,500 years ago, someone had a crazy idea to collect seeds and plant them in the ground and see if they would grow. And they did. <laughs> I found out it was the very beginning of farming and it changed everything because people didn't have to wander around looking for food. They could start villages. As people discovered how to grow new foods, they started to trade with other villages. Soon, everyone had a lot of different kinds of foods to eat. Now, for my egg salad sandwich, I'll definitely need some eggs. I just have to find some chickens. But first, here's a great chicken question from Vanessa. Why do chickens lay different colored eggs? Because I've seen brown eggs and white eggs. That's a tough egg to crack, Vanessa. But I have some experts who can answer your question. Please welcome chicken farmers, Kate Belgwick and her son, Fletcher. Hey, Zoe, I heard you needed some egg layers for your sandwich. You brought chickens? Hi, chickens. You don't have to be chicken around me. This is so exciting. Get it? Mm -hmm. Exciting. So do you often lend chickens to people? We do. We actually rent chickens to people who want to have their own freshly laid eggs all summer. This is awesome. Can I name them? Yes, it's okay for you to name them. We let everyone name them. Oh, boy. I'll name that one Molly, uh, that one Princess Pumpernickel, that one Pipsqueak, and that one Cluffy. <laughs> So why do chickens lay different colored eggs? In the beginning, all eggs are white inside the chicken, and different breeds will lay down a different color or a pigment in the last few hours before they're laid. These three chickens here lay brown eggs, and the chicken over there, she will lay blue eggs. But if you get a cross between the brown egg layers and the blue egg layers, you can get a green egg from them. Green eggs? Is that where green eggs and ham come from? <laughs> So are blue eggs blue inside? <laughs> actually, no, they're all the same inside the shell. So what do they eat? Well, they actually eat this grain food. It's just a mix of grains all crumbled up. 
So how you feed them is you just get a bit of food and you can sprinkle it on the ground and they'll eventually eat it. How long does it take for them to lay eggs? A couple weeks? No, not even close. They'll all lay one egg a day, starting right away. That means I'm gonna have four eggs today. I hope you like omelets. Four eggs a day? That's 28 eggs a week. And then I'll have 112 eggs a month. And then I'll have 1,344 eggs a year. That means I'll have 672 egg salad sandwiches. And so many sandwiches! Oh! You're gonna make my head explode. Oh, I'm gonna have to get cracking. I'm gonna have to get laying, crack. Thanks for lending me your chickens, guys. I'll take excellent care of them. No problem, Zoe. We know you'll be an exceptional <laughs> chicken handler. <laughs> Clucky, pumpernickel, such beauties. Ask a friend. Hey guys, what are your favorite foods that are made with eggs? Eggs with toast. Hot boiled eggs. An egg sandwich. Egg salad and tuna sandwich. Cake. Omelets because they taste really good. Pancakes. I like an over easy, some bacon on the side. Egg sandwich and egg salad. Egg sandwich, but with like ketchup and uh, broccoli. Hmm, I'll try that. Now, what else do I need for my sandwich beside eggs? Oh yeah, bread. I actually got a question about bread. Where does bread come from? That gives me a great idea for... My Great Challenge! Today we're playing What's That Food Made From? Melissa, Kiara, your team Munch. Yeah. Yay! Daniele, Andrea, your team Crunch. Yeah! Each team will have to match up each of the familiar foods over here on the tables with the plant or animal that they're made from over there. Let's pull noodles to see who goes first. Okay, Munch, you guys are going first. Get matching. So do we take the chocolate first? Um, where did it go? There? Those look yeah, like, I think sort it of look like cocoa beans. Oh, there. <laughs> That's right. Chocolate is made by roasting the beads from inside this weird looking cocoa plant pod. Team Crunch, go. Team Crunch selected the popcorn and they're matching it with the corn. And they're right. Heat up dried corn kernels, and they become popcorn. This what? should go. The cinnamon sticks. I think it goes there. Oh. They're matching yeah. the cinnamon sticks with the sugar cane. And that's not right. A lollipop. Team Crunch is matching the lollipop with the sugar cane. That's right. Lollipops are mostly made of sugar, which is made by boiling this tall grass called sugar cane. Bread, maybe? Okay. Yeah, it goes yeah. here. Peanut butter should go in. That's right. Peanut butter is made with peanuts, which grows underground on the roots of the peanut plant. Cheese. I'm sure it goes with the cow. <laughs> yeah. That was an easy one. Cheese. Real easy. I think the maple syrup is from a tree. That one or that one. Okay. Maybe it's wrong. Maybe it's right. It's right. Maple syrup is made with the sap of the maple tree, which gets boiled down to become thick and sugary. Team Crunch is putting their chocolate in front of the cinnamon tree. Nope. A lollipop. Put it there. And Team Munch also gets the cinnamon tree wrong. Agdas, here's the answer to your question. Where does bread come from? Both teams put their bread in front of the wheat. And they're right. Wheat seeds are ground up to make flour, which is the main ingredient in bread. Salt, um, maybe. Ocean is salty. Okay, put it there. I think it's wrong. <laughs> Actually, that's right. Most salt comes from ocean water. Sea salt. Peanut butter. Butter, where does that go? It has peanuts. It has, yeah. The cinnamon sticks. Oh, oh no. We should have switched. That's right, because cinnamon is made from the bark of the cinnamon tree. Let's put it here. Mmm, okay. french fries. Um, with the potatoes. <laughs> That's another easy one. French fries. Popcorn. Pop with corn, because it's like popcorn. popcorn. <laughs> That's the last thing. <laughs> Maple syrup, it comes from a tree, so it makes sense. Okay, you guys are done. Too much? You have eight matches out of ten. Yeah! 
and Team Crunch. You also have eight matches out of ten. Yeah! So it's a tie. Thanks for playing. What's that doing? Now, let's not all let this go to waste. Come on. I want the car. I want the chocolate. Chocolate. I want the pop. Take a good look at that sandwich. Or at that bubble gum. Do you wonder what they're made of? Where did they come from? We can't have bread without ground up wheat. Gum used to be made with rubber from this tree. Such a chewy treat. See those fish sticks on your plate. They're made from haddock solar cord. That candy floss is made with yak hair. All balls up into a wad. What? It's made of sugar? Oh! Well, if you're ever feeding and wondering what you're eating, come sing this song with me. How was ketchup invented? Who doesn't love ketchup? So I checked, and it's made with squished tomatoes, sugar, vinegar, and it goes with everything. But the first ketchup invented didn't taste anything like this stuff. I found out that it was made from mushrooms, walnuts, oysters, or little fish called anchovies. Yummy. Luckily, a scientist named James Meese introduced tomatoes in his new ketchup recipe, and the rest is history. We make tons of good sauces out of tomatoes, but they didn't always have such a good reputation. Deadly and horrible tomato! Save yourself and your children from this stinky, poisonous devil fruit. It was brought to Europe by foolish travelers. Whatever you do, don't eat them, or you will die a horrible death. Instead, try a safe and healthy fruit, like this apple. Oh, it was Mario! Ah, the end is near! Ah. For over 200 years, people in Europe were afraid of tomatoes? That was thanks to a British barber, surgeon, and scientist named John Gerard. He described tomatoes as stinking and being poisonous, and everyone believed him. This myth began because people ate tomatoes on plates made of a metal called pewter and got really sick. But it wasn't the tomatoes' fault. There was a poisonous chemical in the pewter called lead that seeped into the tomatoes. It's too bad for so long Europeans were missing out. Imagine spaghetti and meatballs without the tomato sauce. It's just not the same. You guys are the messiest roommates ever. Look at this place. You know, if we lived in a world without grocery stores, you might think you could get your food directly from farmers. Well, it might not be that easy because a whole lot of the food we get from grocery stores comes from all around the world. So the next time you're at the store, look close at the label and it will show you where in the world it comes from. See, this pair says it's from South Africa. That's way down here. This garlic comes from China. And these grapes were grown in Mexico. Check out your fruits and vegetables at home. See which ones are grown close to where you live. Woohoo! <laughs> 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 huh? Y'all ain't from around here, are ya? Now, here's a question from Alyssa Can you grow food in the city? To answer Alyssa's question, I'm meeting Nicholas Taylor plant science manager who works at a farm. Uh, where's the farm? These are just big old factory buildings. Hey, hey Zoe, Zoe. Zoe. I'm, I'm up, up here. here. Oh, there you are. Hi, Nicholas. Hey, welcome to Lufa Farms, the world's first commercial rooftop greenhouse. Whoa, you really can grow food in the city. But what is your farm doing on the roof? 
Good question. What happens is more and more people are filling up all the spaces around the cities and we're running out of land. What we did was rather than to have a farm outside the city, far away, where we'd have to bring the food in, we brought the farm right into the city. Now, because there's so many buildings, they decided to use areas that were not being used by the people, which is on top of the roofs. What's cool about being on top of a roof is that you capture all that sun that would normally be hitting the roof, but now it's hitting the cucumbers and helping them grow. Here's one of our uh, Lebanese cucumbers. Want to try it? You mean pick it off the tree? Yeah, go for it. Without washing it? You don't have to. We don't use any synthetic pesticides here. Oh, no poisonous chemicals to kill the bugs? Cool. That's really good. When you grow veggies really close to where the people are picking it up, you can pick it as fresh as possible. So it's super good and packed with nutrients. So when food has to travel a long time to get here, it loses its flavor. Absolutely. And Nicholas tells me that when food travels far to get to us, a lot of it spoils and is wasted. And also that transporting it means burning a lot of fuel. That causes pollution. Hey, can I help you plant something? Want to plant some lettuce? Sure. All right, let's do it. So we're going to be planting some butterhead lettuce. They're probably getting a little angry sitting in this tray because we probably should have planted them a couple days ago. So what's cool about this system is that we can grow a lot of lettuce really close together super efficiently. Look, a little bug. That reminds me of a question that I got from Amber. Is bug poison on plants bad for people? In farms, people can use a lot of bug poison in the form of pesticides. And it has been shown to be kind of rough for people, which is why most people will suggest that you always wash your fruits and veggies. But we don't use any synthetic pesticides here. So we fight bugs with bugs. Right here in front of us, we have a lot of bad guy bugs called aphids. They're eating our peppers. One aphid in about one day can make 10 more aphids. And then those 10 make 10, and then those 10 make another 10, <laughs> and then the plant is just completely covered. So what we use to fight these bugs is more bugs. What? In this case, Whoa, ladybugs. That's right. <laughs> but these guys, they're not gonna harm us. They're not interested in me at all. If anything, <laughs> if anything they're probably confused about my arm hair. Whoa. Uh, so they're gonna crawl around and they're gonna look for these aphids on these leaves. It tickles. <laughs> Ladybug, high five. Go. Are you ready? No, I'm good. No, you're gonna squish them. <laughs> so all these guys are gonna hang out here <laughs> because this is the best place in town for ladybugs. Yeah, because they eat the aphids. It's eating one now. That's right, but they don't just eat aphids. They eat all sorts of other little pests. They're kind of like the big boss compared to all the other bugs. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. They're so small. They don't have a tough name, yeah. but they're one of the toughest species we have. Hey, you want to put that out? Sure. That's it, perfect. Good job, little ladybug. This is a sweet pepper. Want to pick it? Sure. <laughs> there you go. Vegetables you can eat the same day they were picked. From a farm in the city on a rooftop. Thanks, Nicholas. This is so exciting. I have fresh vegetables now, and with the eggs from the chicken, my lunch is really starting to come together. But you don't have to get someone else to grow your veggies. You can grow them yourself by planting seeds in your backyard garden or in window boxes. You can even grow new veggies from old leftovers. My friends tried it out. The experiment! And Elaine and Vivian found out that you can grow fresh vegetables from kitchen scraps like these. What are you doing? I'm gonna try and put this piece of celery in water and see what happens. You take the bottom part from a celery bunch and sit it in some warm water in the sun. Let's wait a couple of weeks and see what happens. Okay. It grows new leaves. Take the sprouting celery and plant it in some earth. Try taking the seeds from inside a pepper plant. Plant them in soil and give them a little bit of water. Put your pots in the sun and wait for a couple of weeks. Look it up. You can do this with many kinds of veggies. I can't believe this worked. I know. So there you go. 
plot your table scraps, and have your own indoor mini farm. Now that's local produce. Bye, Bye Zoe. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 <laughs> These veggies have had some time to grow. And look at them now. Looks like I can add some celery to my egg salad. That means I have everything I need to make a sandwich. And I can finally answer the question that started off the show. If there were no grocery stores, where would we get food? The big answer is... We can grow it ourselves or buy it from local farmers. In fact, it looks like we'll be doing this more and more in the future. Growing food close to home can help avoid some big problems, like waste, poisonous pesticides, and air pollution. Plus, the food is healthier and tastes way better. That rooftop farm I visited is just one amazing way to grow food in the city. There are kids planting gardens in their school yards, and community food gardens are popping up all over the place. People have even turned swimming pools into fish farms. It's amazing what you can grow if you get creative. Now all I have to do is make my sandwich. Well, I forgot to grow wheat to make bread. Good thing my mom picked up a loaf of bread from the local farmer's market. That still kind of counts, right? This is the best homegrown sandwich I've ever eaten. Princess Pepper Clucky, your eggs are delicious. Great job, guys. Thanks, Sally. I'm having a party later today. My friend Erica and I share the same birthday, so we're having a double birthday party. But first, I'm going to Erica's house to bake the most awesome cake ever. And maybe even do more because of this question from Maya. What type of experiments can you do in your kitchen? Well, Maya, I definitely think baking is an experiment, especially if you're making something for your first time. This was supposed to be a fluffy cake, but I ended up with this mess. But I'll get the answer to your question by the end of the show. And plus, Erica is a winner of a TV cooking show, so our cake, I mean experiment, is going to be awesome. Hi, Erica. Hi, Zoe. Look what I brought. Cool. <laughs> Thanks. Hey, Erica. Do you think cooking is like an experiment? Cooking is exactly like an experiment. You follow a recipe and see regular ingredients transform into something totally different. So first we're gonna start with the sugar, so you can add this to the flour. Okay. Our tasty experiment uses dry ingredients, like baking soda and baking powder. Wow. Then the wet stuff. <laughs> Good? Yeah. Put it all together and mix it up. So now we have to add the thing that makes this normal vanilla cake a funfetti cake. So the sprinkles. <laughs> it looks so fun. This is gonna be one tasty cake. Once it turns into a cake, that is. <laughs> Which reminds me of a question I got from Adriana. What makes a cake rise? It says magic on the box, but it's not really magic powder, right? No, it's not magic, it's science. It works with the baking soda to create little bubbles of gas. Cool. Both baking powder and baking soda create a cool chemical reaction. It's kind of like when you mix baking soda and vinegar. Watch that chemistry in action. It creates little bubbles of gas. That's when we make our cake rise. Once we add the baking soda to the cake mix, we have to put it in the oven right away. That reminds me of an experiment my friends did. It uses baking soda too. The experiment! Hi, Raphael and Amber. Hi, Hi Zoe. So what are you cooking up in your experiment? It's a secret. We mix baking soda and water in a bowl. Now we could draw something on the paper. Are you guys sure about this experiment? I don't see anything. You're not supposed to. 
Not yet. Oh, I see. It's like invisible ink. Yes. We just have to let it dry. Now we paint lemon juice over our paper. The lemon is acidic and it reacts to the baking soda. And it makes our invisible ink appear. Oh, yeah. This is pretty cool. I see it now. Happy birthday, Zoe! <laughs> that chemical reaction was kind of like the way baking soda reacts with the acidity in our cake mix. It was important to add the right amount of baking soda and baking powder to our cake, or else it wouldn't rise properly. When my family and I cook, if we make a mistake, we can usually turn it into something anyways and make it work. Like one time, we turned spaghetti sauce failure into tomato soup. Cooking is like an art, but baking, it's super precise, like a science. Hang on, I feel an experiment. Yes, a musical experiment. Baker, secret spices in my shaker. I can bake an awesome caker. A pinch of pepper, a dash of salt. I must measure without a fault. Forgot the meat, no need to worry. No baking soda, I'm going blurry. Instead, I made a Zoe surprise. Ha! For my soup light, it just won't rise. They say that cooking is an art. Baking's like science, just look at my chart. I use any ingredients I have on hand. Hey, I can do this cool handstand. Together we can make a delicious meal. Okay, my friend, you got a deal. You got a deal. You got a deal. <laughs> you got a deal. Well, thanks, Erica. I can't wait to taste the cake later. I'm making dough for my mini party pizzas. I hope this experiment works too. Check this out. I let this dough sit for a few hours, and now it's double the size of this one. It's because I put yeast in the dough. And yeast makes things like pizza dough and bread rise. But I'm kind of wondering the same thing as Max. If yeast expands in bread, can it expand in your body? Mm. Ah, me big, me full of yeast. That's scary, but I know someone who can answer the question. He's got all the info on how yeast makes things grow. Please welcome my very special guest, Shakib Rahman. Hi, Zoe. Shakib. <laughs> I ate bread with way too much yeast in it. Wait, what? <laughs> Kidding. <sighs> so, Shakib, what exactly is yeast? It's a living thing, like a plant or an animal. Yeast is a kind of fungus that eats sugar and starch. When it's activated by heat, the yeast eats the sugar and basically farts out carbon dioxide gas. That's what creates the little pockets of air in the dough that make it expand. But the yeast eventually dies from the heat of baking. Also, the acid in our stomach is so strong that it ends up killing the yeast before it can fart out any carbon dioxide. That's why if you eat any bread, you don't get all gassy afterwards. Oh, you. But what's the difference between yeast and baking soda we use in our cakes? Baking soda produces a chemical reaction. It's very, very fast. Oh, so that's why Erica said to put the cake batter in the oven right away after we added the baking soda. Yeah, that's right. You had to get those air bubbles trapped in the cake before they escaped. Yeast, unlike baking soda, is a living thing. It produces its carbon dioxide very, very slowly. So that's why my pizza dough didn't rise so fast. Exactly. Do you want to try another experiment where we can make some chemicals rise? Yeah. I've got exploding elephant toothpaste here. Cool. We're using chemicals, and this experiment is going to create a lot of heat. Safety goggles, safety gloves, check. The first thing I'm going to do is add some hydrogen peroxide in. So you have to be very careful with this stuff, which is why we have our safety gear on. Excellent. Do you want to add the dish soap for me, Zoe? One, two, three. I'm going to add blue food coloring here. Now you've got to add the last ingredient, Special Chemical X Potassium Iodide. Can you see all the steam coming out of there, Zoe? Yeah, I do. Our hydrogen peroxide turned into water, which turned into steam because of all of the heat we're generating, and it also turned into oxygen. And our oxygen got trapped by all of the dish soap, which is why we have all of this nice foamy mess here. 
That's so cool. It really does look like a giant tube of toothpaste that an elephant would use. That's right, but don't try this at home without an adult's help. That reminds me of another question I got from Leah. What's an easy experiment I can make in my kitchen to make things puff up? Well, Leah, some of my friends did a little bit of experimenting. <laughs> the experiment! Hi, Adriana. Hi, Jonah. Hi. Hi. Are you going to amaze me with a puffy experiment? Yeah, we will. We have our bottle ready for the experiment. I'm gonna put the funnel in. And then I'm gonna put some baking soda inside of the bottle. Just gotta make sure it all goes down. Next, I'm gonna put some vinegar in the bottle. I gotta be ready with the glove because I gotta get it on super quick. Check that out, it's like a ghost hand. A ghost hand? Cool! <laughs> the chemical reaction between the baking soda and the vinegar created bubbles of carbon dioxide gas that are blowing up the glove. Let's compare with the next experiment. This one uses yeast with sugar and water. Let's begin. Put the funnel in. Now we do the water. water. Next, I'm going to add the sugar. Now I'm going to add the yeast. And now, we shake it. Now let's get the balloon. Nothing's puffing up yet. This experiment with yeast is much slower. Now we wait. Wow, it's just like when yeast farts out gas and makes bread puff up. The yeast is eating up all the sugar and it keeps farting out gas. It took 10 minutes to puff up, but it was worth the wait. Thanks for the cool experiments. Bye, Zoe. If I waited for yeast to blow up all my party balloons, I would have to wait a while. I'm gonna turn this place into Party Central. Hey, speaking of transforming something, Liat had another question about experiments you can do in your kitchen. Could you turn food into something completely different? Great question, Liat. Shakib has a magic experiment up his sleeve. Go ahead, Shakib. That's right, Zoe. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take some potatoes and turn them into a really cool experiment. The first thing I had to do was I had to take my potatoes, cut them up, and then boil them in water, and then get rid of the water, so I ended up with my potato starch. Now, if you don't have an adult to help you, you can just go to the store and get potato starch from there. The next thing we have to do is take this potato starch, combine it with some tonic water. Mixing a little bit of this tonic water with the potato starch will give us the start of our cool experiment. Now, because this is a little bit messy, I'm gonna put on some gloves and mix this all together. It does this weird thing. It starts to form a solid. But that solid, when I let go of it, starts to flow like a liquid. This is something we call a non-Newtonian fluid. If I squeeze it hard again, you can see that it forms a solid, but by letting go of the pressure, we get a nice liquid that starts to flow again. Here's the magic part. If I turn off the light, something really cool happens. Using a black light, which gives off ultraviolet light, you can see that our potato goo now glows in the dark. The reason for that is the tonic water that we added earlier has a special chemical in it. It's called quinine. Quinine is something that glows when you put it in ultraviolet light. And that's our magic mud experiment. Wow, that magic mud can't decide if it wants to be solid or liquid. <laughs> it's crazy it could be both. And that gives me an idea for... On Team Solid, we have Daniel and Lex. Whoa! <laughs> and on Team Liquid, we have Veronica and Fabiola. <laughs> In today's challenge, you're actually gonna be both liquid and solid. Well, the magic mud you're going to be using is both. In each pot, I filled it with a bunch of items that have to do with cake. The team with the most items at the end of the challenge wins. Go! It's a pretty sticky challenge. <laughs> uh, Team Liquid has two. Oh. Team Solid has one right now. Team Liquid is in the lead at three. Team Solid has two. Oh, Team Solid's catching up. I got one. Ugh. Team Liquid has five. That's Team hard. Solid has four. Five. Hard. Team Liquid has six. Oh. Team Solid has to keep digging if they oh. want to catch up. They're trying to go fast, but it doesn't work because that magic mud gets really hard. Ugh. Solid has eight. Just Team so Solid's in the lead right now, go, guys! Go, 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 go. So 
Oh, and they're at nine. Okay. Go, go, go. Oh. oh, Team Liquid back on top. Oh, that was fast. Uh. <laughs> there we go. Okay. okay, time's up. You guys have 12. And Team Solid, you guys have 11. So that means we have a winner. Team Liquid, you win. <laughs> Good job, guys. <laughs> Good job, guys. Thanks. So what was the right. stickiest part? Yeah. The magic mud. Because you think you have an object, but you, you really don't. don't. <laughs> yeah. The stickiest part is that I can't get my hands out. <laughs> well, thanks, guys, for being on my show. You're welcome. welcome. You're welcome. Do I bring this box with me? It's stuck if to you me. have to. It's stuck to me <laughs> like cement. <laughs> that was awesome. And it made me dream about birthday cake and a big glass of... Holy! This milk went bad. Ugh. It's like it's an experiment on its own. Ugh. That reminds me of a question I got from Anastasia. Why does the milk get disgusting and chunky when you leave it on the counter for a long time? She'll tell us why it gets lumpy, because bad milk sure makes us grumpy. Please welcome bacteria investigator Maya Hay. Hey, Zoe. Hi, Maya. I brought you some food. Mmm, food. <coughs> Yum. Do you see how the food is starting to change color and that there's some slime and fuzz developing on top? Yeah. That's because the food is starting to break down from bacteria. And the same thing happens with the milk. When milk breaks down, it gets clumpy like this. That's gross. Bacteria is in all foods. It's everywhere, actually, so this is totally normal. The bacteria take the natural sugar that are in milk and they make waste. But that bacteria poop is really acidic and that reacts with the milk. When the milk starts to break down, it starts to get clumpy and it curdles just like that. Now, check this out. I have some of this bacteria that I grew on a Petri plate. Do you see any on this? No. That's because I only put it on this morning so they haven't had a chance to grow yet. But check this out. Do you see any there? Yeah. So, how many do you think are in that Petri plate? 500. Keep going. 10,000? Keep going. A million? There are billions in this tiny Petri plate. Billions? That's like the entire population of the world. Imagine that in a glass of milk. Yay. You're gonna make my head explode. <laughs> Slow your roll, bacteria. I found out there's a way to do that. Bacteria move a lot more slowly in a cold place, so they don't multiply into billions as fast. That's why keeping milk and food in the fridge makes it last longer. There's another way to preserve milk, and that's to use the help of bacteria. Here's what we're gonna do. This is some milk. And then what I want you to do is add this starter culture. It's basically a special mix of bacteria. I want you to add two tablespoons to it. So these are good bacteria, not the kind that can make you sick. Exactly. Two. Great, now give it a mix. What happens when we mix it? So what mixing it does is it introduces the bacteria to all of those sugars, and then when you wait 12 to 18 hours later, it's gonna turn into yogurt like this. That's crazy. So how does it do that? It's called fermentation. Basically, the bacteria took the milk sugars and made it into an acid, and that acid reacted with the milk, and it thickened it just like this. Do you wanna try? Yeah. Thanks. Now that's delicious. Thanks, Maya. You're welcome. It's pretty amazing there's good bacteria that we can use to make food, and then there's bad bacteria that can make us sick. There was a time when people weren't so sure what caused sickness. A flat Earth corner! The evil wind is blowing. I must not breathe in the vapor. It will strike me down with the deadly cholera, poisonous wind, and disgusting smell. Why must you curse us with your evil stink? I cannot catch the disease. I must not breathe in the wind. <coughs> Catch 
catching a deadly disease from the wind? About 200 years ago, that's what people thought. In 19th century England, there was a huge outbreak of a deadly disease called cholera. A whole lot of people died from it because it couldn't be controlled. Back then, they thought it was caused by mysterious clouds of air filled with bits of rotting things and smelling gases. But a doctor named John Snow found something out. He discovered that city drinking water from some of the pumps were dirty and infected. They didn't have good sewers like we have today. So it wasn't because of something they were breathing. It was because of something they were drinking. I'm glad we know so much about bacteria today. I'm also glad I didn't drink that spoiled milk before. Oh yeah, party time is getting closer. My friends and I love chicken wings, so these will be a big hit. Oh, that reminds me. Uh-oh, do try this at home. I put this chicken bone in some vinegar about a week ago. Check this out. You have to rinse it off and watch. A rubber chicken bone. The vinegar dissolves a mineral called calcium, which is what makes bones hard. Without the calcium, what's left is just this soft bone. Hi, guys! Hi! Hi. <laughs> wow, our cake looks delicious. Mm. It was definitely a successful experiment. I think I'm ready to answer the question that started off the show. What type of experiments can you do in your kitchen? Well, Maya, the big answer is, drum roll please. There is no limit. Today we did experiments that used all different kinds of science, like chemistry, physics, and biology. Using kitchen ingredients, some of them were even good to eat. You can do tons of kitchen experiments with really basic stuff. The kitchen is our lab and we're the scientists. But here's my favorite kitchen experiment. Let's find out if the cake is delicious. Yeah! This is good. I love experiments. 